very much. And uh, yeah, I hope also um, the attendees will like today's talk. But it will be not about blockchain. It will be a bit more about traditional software development topics, maybe. But also exciting, I hope. Uh, and we will talk about testing. Uh, the title of the talk is called Rethinking the Pyramid Integration Testing with Docker and Test Containers. And um, yeah, that's what it will be about, testing, integration testing specifically, and how we can modernize and use some more new concepts to make our integration testing work better for us, basically, and how this might influence the way we think about the classical testing pyramid. Um, so feel free to ask the question, if you have any questions uh, during the talk actually directly and if I see them and maybe I see that they uh, are a good fit at this point I will try to answer them directly and else we will have the usual Q&A session at the end of the talk. Uh, a little bit about myself so my name is Kevin Wittek and yeah I'm an Oracle Roundbreaker ambassador that's also why I'm here at the tour and virtually again but I hope in the future soon maybe in person uh, this will also become possible again and um, now, uh, as compared to last year, some things have changed. So now I'm a software engineer at uh, Atomic Jar and Atomic Jar is a test containers company. So I'm more or less now fully focused on this whole test containers and testing story. Also in my day job, blockchain doesn't play a role there anymore, but I'm also still uh, officially a PhD student at the university here in Germany and my PhD topic is still the uh, blockchain stuff. So I have to wrap it up eventually. And I hope this will happen soon in the future. And I'm also a coach and, and trainer with my own company doing some uh, online courses nowadays. Mostly you can find them on LinkedIn Learning by now. And um, yes, I'm one of the test containers maintainers. So the test containers open source project. And generally I like to be in touch with the open source community, open source Java community in particular. And um, yes, all my professional life as a software developer, I have been personally motivated to test. But uh, yeah, if we would see each other now, I would just ask you these questions like, why do we test as developers? So I'm a developer and I would assume many of you are developers as well. Some also might be testers, that's also cool, of course. Um, and I would be interested to know, like, why, why do you test? Like, do you test because someone tells you, okay, you have to test the software as part of the quality gate or whatever, or what is, what is in it for you? Um, for me personally, testing has become a crucial part of my whole development workflow. So developing software and testing software, it's uh, very combined for me. It's like one singular activity that has some faces that, uh, I alternate between each other but yeah for me testing is generally part of my development because testing my software is the fastest way to understand if the code i wrote works that's how i think about it and i think it's also the most enjoyable way to see if uh, software works so i hate this uh, other process where you would maybe make changes and have to run something locally in some whatever bring it in a certain state the system then check the logs or click around or run some commands the rest api verify that it's correct um, so that's for me not enjoyable to work i much rather follow a general ttd approach even for for bigger uh, functionalities where i think first okay how i can test it and then i implement against this and i think this is a, a very nice professional way to work as a software developer nowadays so in, with this in mind, uh, I think we should uh, reach setups of our development projects where the getting started experience is something like this. And um, uh, not only in uh, open source projects, so in open source projects, I want to get an start experience that looks roughly like this, but uh, also in our classical enterprise, business projects, whatever. That's how the experience should be if a new member joins the team. Um, so basically, they should come into the team, check out, uh, clone the project, whatever, and then just use the build system of your choice, Maven or Gradle or whatever. And this should then just build the system, run the tests, unit tests, integration tests, maybe even some functional tests or UI tests, and without requiring 
setting up uh, anything by hand. So this means what I don't want to see anymore in software projects is that we have those like um, multiple pages, wiki pages or whatever that tells you, okay, you have to install JBoss, you have to copy it there, you have to uh, install the Postgres database, make sure to import the schema first, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This I don't like. And I don't think we as an industry should uh, keep up this practice. Instead, it should look like this. We should use our code infrastructure as code approaches to codify the setup of our development environment, of our test environment. And I think a lot of tools go into this direction that help us with this. Uh, also recently, uh, the feature in Gradle, for example, the, uh, what is it called, uh, Java toolchain feature where you specify the JDK version to use. This helps with this approach. Things like Gradle wrapper, Maven wrapper help with this approach. But then also container technology and tools like Docker and test containers help you this is approach to set up the uh, environment in a more automated way. This is my development environment. Testing is part of my development. And yes, a little bit about Pyramid. So I recently uh, saw a very nice documentary with my wife about the so-called Pyramid of the Sun. It is a pyramid in Bosnia, in Vizoko. And uh, here you can see a picture of it. And it is actually... Uh, an open question in the scientific community if this uh, structure here if this hill is a pyramid but there are some people uh, in this uh, region uh, archaeologists but he's not really an archaeologist yeah it's a strange guy he says this is a pyramid that has been built by uh, yeah humans is one of the earliest pyramids in human history he says while others say it's actually just a hill that has a pyramid shape and um, then some of the very famous pyramid scientists and researchers from Egypt, they say, okay, yes, pyramid is actually defined by its shape and not by its origin. So a pyramid doesn't need to be uh, human made. It just needs to have a pyramid shape. So it's a very uh, interesting story. And uh, I, I just uh, like to share this uh, controversial story with uh, other people about this pyramid of the sun in Bosnia. But I also like us to rethink about a bit about um, the testing pyramid and about the shape of the testing pyramid and um, what we need from the testing pyramid nowadays in, in modern software development times. And of course, this is obviously a pyramid shape. And that's what we know since the early 2000s. This has been um, established mostly through Mike Cohn and other people from the agile community. And we had the idea that in modern software development, we want to have a, a test suite that is composited like this with a big base of uh, foundation of unit tests, a lot of unit tests, like small unit tests. And then the middle layer, we have some less integration tests. And then at the top, we have the UI tests, ideally automated, and then some more manual ones. And there is, of course, a, a reason why people said this is the shape we should follow, this is a good shape, this leads to maintainable test suite, this leads to maintainable software. Because the assumption is that the higher you go, the more flaky, the more brittle the tests become, the harder to write, the harder to maintain. And uh, historically, this is probably true. Uh, although I'm not sure if there is really quantifiable research about this shape. It's just uh, like many things in uh, software development it is more like a cargo culture thing that just like suddenly was there and people ensured each other that is the way to go. Still, this is something we often have in mind and how we composite our test suite. Uh, but there are some changes uh, about this currently we see in the community. But before we go into the other shapes, let's talk a little bit the middle layer integration tests. What do integration tests mean? Because this is one of the first problems already of our industry that we don't have clear definitions for unit tests, for integration tests. And without those clear definitions, it's hard to separate them from each other. And uh, my definition, which is in line with also how many other people define it, would say uh, that integration tests are those tests that interact with external systems and dependencies. And mostly I think of them as uh, tests that interact with 
external processes. So what can those processes be? Uh, very often it's something like a database. That's a perfect example. Or anytime you have to call something over the wire, over the network, like other microservices or whatever, these I would consider integration services. Uh, interacting with the file system, because it's also an external process uh, provided to you by the operating system. This I would also consider uh, integration testing. But what I would not consider integration testing, if I have, for example, two classes in my own code bases interact with each other, this is for me a unit test. But uh, other people in the community might call this also an integration test already once you leave the boundaries of the class. But if I'm just testing code, uh, that is under my control, that's written by me interacting with each other, for me clearly a unit test. However, things like uh, Spring Boot tests, for example, that would spin up the whole application context and that then would instrument my code. This is also more on the integration testing side for me. Um, so, yes, so now let's uh, reflect a bit with knowing this and knowing that the middle part of integration test is defined like this. Let's reflect on the pyramid shape a bit and look at other shapes that come up recently and the most famous one and i've seen uh, iterations of this that are different in small details but the core idea is the same so the famous one is the testing honeycomb i think so uh, a honeycomb um, like a bee honeycomb yeah that's the shape of it and there are other uh, examples like testing trophy similar shape testing diamond similar shape and the core idea of those is that you have much fewer uh, implementation detail tests like those classical unit tests that are very uh, detail oriented about the code you have a much broader uh, corpus of integration tests that test the integration of your system as a whole with outside components and um, then you have some others at the top which uh, they like to define as integrated tests and uh, this is a very nice concept to think about, this integrated test, and it's a good way to um, uh, distinguish a certain class of good integration tests from other integrated tests, exactly those we previously thought of as those very flaky, flaky hard to maintain, and brittle tests. These are generally integrated tests. So what does integrated test mean? Um, this came up in a blog post from J.B. Rainsberger from the Agile community. And a nice definition here, I use the term integrated test to mean any test whose result, pass or fail, depends on the correctness of the implementation of more than one piece of non-trivial behavior. And Spotify summarizes as a test that will pass or fail based on the correctness of another system. And we can uh, give some examples. Um, and now the examples I want to specifically look at are those that assume that the surrounding system is in a certain state. And um, this is the case if we have to, for example, manually spin up other services in our local testing environment. So our integration test can only run and only succeed if we have a database running, a Postgres database or whatever, or Oracle database in a certain state. And... Um, yeah, our test will fail if we forgot to bring the database into the state or if we forgot to even start it or install it or configure it directly. And um, this is an example for those integrated tests that we want to avoid uh, as much as possible. Or other examples we often have if we have a shared testing environment and if other teams or other developers also use a shared testing environment, for example, host databases or whatever, then uh, they might pollute the system there and the state of the system and then our tests might break because they assume the system to be in a certain state, which is not true anymore because someone else mutated it. And uh, in the same way, if we all, like different teams build different microservices and we all test them in integration together in a shared environment and um, you change maybe the API and this then makes the tests of others fail, this is also something we want to avoid and we want to decouple. We don't have to avoid them to 100%. So a final stage where we test those things in real integration with each other is still fine. But... Um, this should be like the last stage and we want to be confident that our system in itself with the surrounding uh, components dependencies works correct before we 
or check against the other things. So, and those we want to avoid, but we still want to have good integration tests that bring us confidence. And what can we do? So there is a certain history about how our integration testing and our approach to integration testing transformed over the recent years, and uh, especially in the beginning. And we can look a little bit to databases here because databases are, I think, one of the prime examples uh, for integration testing, especially nowadays where people again like to add more functionality to the database for very good reasons because having uh, more functionality executed in the database brings us much better performance in a lot of cases instead of completely decoupling our application from the database all the time and then losing out on the power that the database brings us in the first place. So um, initially, like sometimes the only way to, to work with a, a database for testing in a reasonably fast uh, feedback loop was mocking it away. And we all know the pain of mocking it depends on the use case but mocking especially like mocking the results of sql statements or whatever or mocking the interaction you have with a um, object relational mapper like hibernate or so on um, provides you with a test use that gives you a very very little confidence about what is uh, actually happening with your code and it's also very brittle you have to um, it gives us less it gives you less flexibility to refactor and so on and so on but yeah that how it was for a long time and it still is for certain use cases that we have to use mocking mocking and it's fine when we are aware of it um, but then of course we saw a rise of database that were available locally on your on your system so you would install it, configure it in a way that you could integration test against this of course works mostly with the smaller databases like the mysql postgres or something like Oracle XE. Uh, these were then the, the main uh, databases you would use there. And, and also then a lot of people started to use uh, H2 or uh, HSQL as uh, just testing uh, databases and um, where they would try to emulate the behavior of the real database. And then once you hit production, you would see, of course, that the emulation just worked to a certain degree. And it also gives you, in general, less confidence. Or sometimes you even have to start maintaining multiple code bases, depending on if you use in testing the H2 database. And then in production, you go against Oracle, that you want to use the Oracle database features. Yeah, I think you all know about this. Um, we then uh, started also with the rise of infrastructure as code approaches. We got things like Vagrant to uh, set up virtual machine-based environments for us, and it worked quite well. But virtual machines, of course, are a bit more on the heavy side, especially back then when you would use maybe something like VirtualBox and so on and spinning everything up. Takes some time, reverting it to a certain state. A state takes a lot of time. And... Um, then we, of course, got uh, Docker and containers. And this changed the game quite a lot because suddenly we could uh, instrument uh, certain infrastructure aspects very easily using containers as a much easier abstraction as a full-fledged virtual machine. And um, then thanks to the tool called FIG, which we now know as Docker Compose, we were even able to uh, specify whole sets of services we would Want to use for testing against in our integration test, for example. And uh, I would like to say that now we reached a state where we can directly integrate the Docker API into our test to instrument the infrastructure in a more powerful way. And test containers is a, a way to provide this API in a very Java object oriented friendly way to you. And we will look into this so I will skip about the Docker part because I assume Docker knowledge. Uh, if there is no Docker knowledge, then uh, sorry, I would recommend that you get some experience with Docker because nowadays it's uh, just generally very useful uh, for a lot of concepts to have a rough idea what Docker is, or containers. Um, but for the sake of the rest of the um, examples and talk let's just say docker is a way to instrument uh, applications yeah? it's more applications and not machines that is the important thing applications and in a certain way and also to distribute them that is a nice thing so 
Um, now we want to bring those access to the Docker API into our code, into our Java code, into our test suite. And why do we want to uh, do it? To make the whole setup of the dev environment very easy and also uh, bring it directly into our test code because I want to have a uniform build and test environment that is self-contained and portable and works in all environment. And what do I mean exactly with this? So a lot of CI systems provide you the way to specify also a dependencies as part of your pipelines that would be spun up as Docker container. So one example, GitLab CI allows this. It can say, okay, here I will need a MySQL database uh, in this step of the pipeline and it will spin it up as a um, Docker container. But now you have two different ways potentially how to spin up your test environment. So in CI, the CI does it for you with some quirks maybe. How would you know? If you do it locally, you have to find another way. Run a Docker command by hand, use Docker Compose, whatever. And that's not cool because then what might happen is that uh, the test just behaves differently in testing as in your on your local machine. So it's much better to use the same uh, code infrastructure as code uh, approach in all the environments you are using. And then, yeah, uh, what I don't want to see anymore in the future is those uh, long instructions, how to install and set up the external software that is necessary for building and testing the software. Um, yeah, but of course, uh, like this, we get another dependency, a dependency on Docker or, or maybe other container runtimes that might work as a substitute or might arise as a substitute in the future. And yep, how we bring those together, the Docker API and Java. And yes, the example we will look at is test containers, the test containers Java open source library. And um, this is how it looks in a vanilla Java way. If you just look at the object-oriented API test containers provides. Test containers has an abstraction over Docker containers, those container classes. So you can instantiate container objects. In this case, I use a generic container class. Generic container works with any image. So anything you can run as a Docker container, you can uh, specify as a Docker image you can use with this container. So just specify it uh, in the constructor also. Yes, I have to admit, sorry, this is the legacy constructor we are using here, but the details doesn't matter. Uh, so ultimately you just uh, specify uh, the Docker image and the tag you want to use. And you can specify some more things like for example, with which port you want to interact and then you start it. And then if you're done with testing, you stop it and then test can, containers will clean up everything for you. Um, yeah, that, that's all there is. Uh, so very, very easy. And of course now one might say like, oh, okay, but I can do the same by doing something like, uh, like a Docker command. So this is similar to Docker run Redis 302 and then exposing the port 6379, yes. So, yep, this is, this is functionally very equivalent. But uh, one thing, a very important uh, thing is different. So, of course, on the one hand, this is now a Java API, so very comfortable. And then this start command here is different from the general Docker container run or Docker start command in that it, uh, oh, no, it didn't, didn't actually start. Okay. Uh, Run. Ah, look, this it doesn't even start, whatever. Uh, so the important thing I want to focus on is it's probably old image doesn't start like this. Uh, the important thing I want to focus on is that the um, start command here is not the same as the Docker run. The Docker run or Docker container start will just um, start the container and then the command returns. But uh, the con like starting the container is not the same as starting the application inside the container. Starting the con uh, application inside the container might take considerably more time. Uh, starting the container just means initiating this process, this container process, which is a couple of sub-seconds. So milliseconds, whatever. Starting the actual application can take seconds, sometimes even minutes in case of Oracle database, for example. And... Um, 
test containers will block uh, or wait the execution block at this point starting until um, a certain um, a certain uh, aspect uh, or the, the, the container fulfills a certain assumption. So these are called wait strategies for test containers. And in this case, a simple case, until the port, this port here is reachable and is accepting connections. And by this, your test then can be sure that your uh, um, that the um, dependent dependencies like the other uh, systems, the other components, are ready to be tested against to be used in your test. And this um, make this adds a lot of um, stability to the whole test suite. So some more um, information about the whole project. Test containers Java is the name also on, under which you can find it on GitHub and has been first released by in 2015 by Richard North. And um, it's 100 percent open source and is under MIT license. And we have more than 65 releases by now and also more than 150 contributors. So a lot of people just um, bringing in pull requests or whatever if they find features lacking or there are certain issues they discover. So we try to foster an, an active community around it as an open source project that is very important for us. And we are currently three core maintainers for test containers, Java, and as is uh, already mentioned, Richard North. And also we have Sergey Agarov and then me. And uh, by now we all uh, work at Atomic Jar. So Richard and Sergey actually the founders of Atomic Jar. And um, through this, we can also give a little bit of more focused uh, backing to the whole test containers project as a whole before it was just something we did as a um, more or less uh, side project or hobby, but an important hobby for us. But yeah, maintaining it in our private time, so to say. Now we have some also um, professional time we can invest in this and we hope this will even further um, improve the overall quality going forward although it is already a quality project i'd like to think and we have um, uh, forks and implementations also in other languages that um, follow the same concepts and ideas but they currently don't really share a lot of code but they share knowledge and they share concepts. And we have those in many languages, Python, C Sharp, Rust, Go, JavaScript. And we have a special wrappers uh, for other JVM languages like Scala and Clojure. And um, yes, they are also used and uh, used in bigger projects. So the Go one, for example, is quite famous in the Go community, but the Java one is the one we are uh, with our main focus currently, I would say. And it's also the most uh, feature complete. So uh, yeah, the others might have sometimes less features than the Java version. Yep, so we get more and more stars, which is quite nice. And for a Java project, that's uh, a quite good amount of stars, I would say. And some of the features it provides, uh, we already saw in series this example of uh, generic Docker container support. So you can throw in any image you want. Then we have support for databases like special support, where those uh, um, like some configurations are already in place or they give you some uh, easier APIs, uh, for example, to get directly the JDBC URL with the map ports and so on. And um, like just recently, we also updated our Oracle, uh, Oracle container support. Uh, so you should get much better experiences when for Oracle databases, Oracle Express editions, but also the others. So every Oracle container, you can run an image. Um, of course, some take considerably longer to start than others. So it might degrade your overall development experience, but the Express edition really starting reasonably fast by now. And um, yeah, then also very specialized support for those stream processing systems, something like Apache Kafka, Apache Pulsar, and so on. And those um, cloud uh, mock services. So if you want to test against AWS services, um, then they have a then AWS provides something called local stack, and we have support for this, so that you are testing against a mock cloud service, but over the over the wire and using the real uh, clients and and APIs. Um, yes, then. 
um, support for Docker Compose. So if you already have existing Docker Compose configuration, you can generally just use it or reuse it. Um, also, we generally recommend that you should think about using test containers as an alternative to Docker Compose because um, being able to specify everything with Java code or as a co as real code as opposed to the declarative YAML way is sometimes just uh, more convenient. Support for Selenium that will run Selenium browser uh, then in a container in a more or less headless way, uh, which I will also show in a demo in a bit, and also support for the currently uh, very uh, interesting concept of chaos testing, um, for example, with Toxy proxy. So uh, where you will introduce uh, errors into your system during testing with Toxy proxy, you can simulate dropping packages, network packages, or latency, network latency, and it is uh, also a very very nice way for for testing those scenarios. And then of some of the other features is a, a dynamic port binding this is just um what we what we see if we let's let's do with the httpd i know it works okay if i do something like this in docker so uh that is that is a, a publishing port publishing not port mapping port publishing feature from docker and then if we check then docker will automatically publish this port onto a free port, free ephemeral port on my system. And then I can, of course, access it. Okay, and um, this is the uh, way test containers does it, as opposed to something like this. Of course, you can, like many people, when they use Docker the first time, they always think like this. I think like, okay, I need to um, map a port to another fixed port so that I know in my test under which port to uh, interact with it. And this is something test containers discourages. So we uh, uh, propose this other approach with just publishing to a certain free port. And then test containers gives you an API to get the actual map port after the container has started. And this also leads to further stability of tests because uh, this makes the test work even if the normally map port is blocked. If you suddenly run tests in parallel and so on, you will always end up with free ports. So this is very important and very convenient and something we very highly encourage to use and explore and think about how to inject then those uh, ports into your system under test during tests. And it always works in all the test frameworks. You just have to understand what is the general approach in your test framework of choice or in your web framework of choice. Then already I talked about this waste strategies. Um, meaning test containers will wait until the application is ready inside the container. Can be, for example, a TCP port is open, can be certain HTTP response, can be certain log message in the container. And then very nicely, we automatically discover the uh, environment, the way Docker is installed and configured in your, on your system. And then uh, test containers will automatically use it. So you don't have to configure anything by hand. This is a whole environment discovery mechanism built into test containers. So it will work with Docker machine, with if you have a Docker daemon set using Docker host variable or Docker for Mac, Docker for Windows, classic Docker on Linux, it will just directly work. You don't have to do anything. And also by means of this mechanism, we are completely platform independent supporting all the uh, operating systems or major operating systems. And on Windows uh, 10, 11 or so, yes, uh, even with name pipe support. So not only using the TCP uh, socket approach on Docker for Windows legacy approach, which, which you also should not use because it's very insecure. No, we can communicate with it really using the native name pipes. And yes, we uh, work on all major CI systems or all CI systems we are aware of because test containers users use test containers in those systems. Um, we are currently uh, ourselves testing uh, using GitHub Actions and then for something Azure DevOps pipeline as well for testing our Windows build. And we also have a Circle CI build running because there have to be some particular things you had to configure in Circle CI in the past. So we added this, but um, 
yes, uh, in general, it will work everywhere. And if you have any problems, then just get in touch with the community and we will generally figure it out what is what is up there. And mostly uh, issues arrive if people are not sure how Docker is set up in the CI system. So test containers need, of course, access to Docker for Docker to work. Um, yes, we have some test framework specific integrations. So here we see uh, JUnit 4 integration. If you annotate a field with a rule or add class rule, then test container will automatically start and stop the container per test method or per test class. Uh, we have the same for other test frameworks like for Spock, the groovy testing framework, which you can also use to test your Java code, works in a similar way. And then for JUnit Jupyter, so JUnit 5, similar you have a test containers extension you annotate your class with and then containers that should be so containers in fields that should be instrumented by the extension should be further uh, annotated with container also works for nested tests and so on and so on um, but um, i would not generally encourage uh, this in all cases so using those test framework uh, integrations because, for example, starting stopping container for every test method is quite expensive, as we will see now, and we will look now in some hands-on stuff in a little demo. So I'm having here a, a Java project, Java Gradle project, and if you want to use test containers, all you have to do is add the dependency. So the specific uh, the containers, the specific modules are all their own dependencies. So this brings in Kafka support, Postgres support, this J unit Jupyter, and then you can use a bill of materials as we know from the Maven world, and this will align the uh, versions. Uh, oh, look, I have double of this. Yes, this I don't need, but so not, ah, no, sorry, sorry. This was not the test containers one. This was the real J unit Jupyter one. Um, Yes, so that's, that's all you have to do. And then if you have Docker installed, that's all. Now you can use test containers. And I have a simple example project without any uh, frameworks involved and so on. So I have a book um, DTO class, yeah, like a data class just with two fields, name and author, uh, that's all. And then we have a book repository class that would then um, save or interact with a persistence store JDBC resource in this case, and um, just using plain Java SQL to, to save it. And uh, yeah, we have a save method, a count method, and a search method. Uh, and the implementation of those methods is not really important. We just want to look at what the tests do, because now we want to test that this works in an integration testing way. All right, so uh, let's check at the Jupyter tests and now I'm using the test framework um, uh, extension, the so Jupyter test framework extension. And so I have my test classes annotated like this. And then I have a container. Now we see it's one of the uh, special Postgres, uh, one of the special database containers. And this brings us methods like these here. Yes, so we can check here database container, then yeah those kind of methods. We don't have those on the generic container, they are on those database containers. And we can directly get the JDBC URL, for example. And if we check into the implementation of this method, we see that directly a JDBC URL gets constructed. And yeah, this is like the general JDBC prefix. Then we get the uh, IP address from the container, although there's a bit misleading the name here. This is the IP under address under which the uh, map port of the container is reachable because then we get here the map port. This is what I meant. We always published a port dynamically and then we add it. And um, yes, so yeah, that's it. And now let's look at the, at the test. So we use Flyway for database migration, but you can use anything. So I just use this to uh, set up the initial database schema. And um, then uh, yeah, we have a couple of simple tests. So an empty repository will be empty. And if we save a book, we will have one book in there. If we have a couple of books, we can search at uh, specific books using uh, the author query, yes, by author. So let's run them. And the way we use it here, uh, this will spin up a new database container for each test. So it will be a bit on the 
slow side, maybe this we should keep in mind. So here we see already the logs, possibly starting. Okay, yes, 10 seconds for the first test. Um, now, okay, the next one a bit faster because the first uh, test run already have always has a bit like gradle overhead in. Um, yeah, in summary, five seconds per test, uh, which is okay, considering that we start a complete new database container. So not even new schema or so on, yes? Complete new database container for every test. And we can be sure we're testing against a super nice clean database. Um, yeah, but of course, if we have a lot of those tests, they sum up, and there might be better ways to do it in stat and faster ways. And for this, I would uh, generally consider um, so if we make this static, then um, we would now reuse the same container for all tests in this class. That's already an improvement. And now instead of um, instead of so now instead of solving test pollution by setting putting their new infrastructure for each test, which is still a little bit uh, expensive. Uh, it's, it's just easier to um, uh, clean it up on a logical level. So just clean up the database after each test. Now we saw here in total, it took like 20 seconds and each test took five seconds, just the first one longer because there was an additional Gradle overhead. If we run it now, it should be considerably faster if I did it correctly. Yes, so now we are in the milliseconds uh, range. And I think with this, we can, we can live very well. So we have some initial overhead for starting the container first time when our test suite runs, but then we reuse the same and it's considerably fast. And then afterwards, everything gets cleaned up. And if we check here, Docker PS, okay, yes, of course, this is the old one we had still running. Okay, let's do yeah, watch Docker PS see what is happening here. So while the tests run, we now see one helper container from test containers appearing and then the Postgres, we are interacting with it. And then after the tests are done, uh, so first the uh, container we use is cleaned up. And then also in a couple of seconds, the test containers helper containers cleaned up. So those Rio container, if some of you wonder what is this for, this is uh, just for cleaning up uh, containers afterwards. Okay, and uh, just for the sake of it, another example, I have here a class that uses a Kafka to send out messages. That's all what it is in a nutshell. And we can look at how it works here. So here again, we have a special container, Kafka container. And yeah, we don't have to do a lot actually. And we don't have to <laughs> know a lot about Kafka because I'm not actually a super Kafka expert. We just add this module here. And then if we start it, we can, uh, again, let me, oops, I closed the terminal by accident. Watch S. Uh, we can see here Kafka container spinning up. So. Now this takes a couple of seconds because Kafka is also a bit of a bigger thing. You have Kafka, you have the zookeeper inside and yes, all good, everything worked. All right. Okay, so um, I have actually so many more things to say and to show, but we are running a little bit of, out of time. So let me summarize some more things, uh, yes, do's and don'ts. So uh, I would encourage you all to try out test containers. And if you're already using it, uh, here also some other things to consider. One thing is um, if you wanna get files into the container, use the copy file to container API instead of the mounting API, which we also have, because this API will work in all Docker setups. Like in CI, you maybe have the Docker daemon not running uh, on the same host as the tests. And uh, then mounting from the class path will not work or in Docker and Docker setups also will not work. Copy file to container always works. So uh, try to migrate to this method whenever you need files from your project in your containers. 
then uh, don't use fixed ports. Uh, there are some ways in test containers to enforce fixed ports, but it's completely discouraged and it's never you never needed. It's never one hundred percent necessary. There are always better solutions to use, use those dynamic ports and then get the map port and use it in your tests. Um, then uh, I've shown you just quickly that we have this helper container, this Rio container, um, and uh, uh, it can be disabled and it has to be disabled in certain CI environments, but it has a lot of implications like that. It doesn't allow you to, uh, so it will not always then clean up all the resources after the test. So um, only disable it if you really know what you're doing and just don't do it as a, as a workaround for, I don't know, issues you're not really understanding as at its core, because that's what we've seen sometimes happening in the past. So uh, yeah check with the community or whatever first about this and uh, then uh, we uh, we often heard also people about uh, using potman as a docker drop in replacement and saying like oh but uh, why can't we use uh, test containers with potman directly like you can just alias the docker command no test containers interacts with the docker socket using the docker api uh, so it not it's not a directly a replacement if you just alias command or whatever. And uh, also Portman uh, differs in certain ways, but um, from, uh, so we are also in touch with Red Hat and the Portman uh, developers, and they are working on uh, making Portman more uh, compatible and also more compatible towards test containers. And um, yes, this is something we can also have an eye on in the future. Okay, so, uh, and this is also something I wanna <laughs> wanna show you. Uh, you can also check this, this uh, in our official documentation. We also have this example there, singleton container pattern. Uh, in a lot of cases, the best way to integrate test containers in a test suite is by um, having this pattern. This pattern uh, means that the container lifecycle is bound to the JVM lifecycle. So then you have just really one instance of the container for the whole lifetime of your test suite, which is in general the most performant way to do things. And uh, one approach we like to, how we like to do it, and we also do it ourselves, is uh, having, for example, an abstract base class for your integration test. And it has a static initializer that will then start the containers. And then everywhere you need those containers, you extend those base uh, class. This means the containers will be started when this class is loaded by the class loader. And now you might say like, okay, they are started when they are stopped. You don't have to stop them because when the JVM exits, then those Rio helper container will automatically clean up all the test containers resources for you. So a very convenient uh, and uh, low tech way to uh, connect the container lifecycle to your JVM lifecycle. All right, and uh, yeah, so we currently have version 160, 161 will come. Uh, I have many more things to show, but uh, since we run out of time and I would really love to answer some of your questions, um, I will conclude my session here. And uh, yes, would, would like to uh, interact with you a bit. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? So I don't see any right now. But feel free to ask anything. Uh, I would like to like to answer them. Yes, yeah, seems that there are no questions. I yeah. found the the presentation uh, was very interesting. I learned already some stuff, some things, and I hope that attendees also learned and they should have some questions. But if they don't, maybe they were not attentive. I don't know. <laughs> no. Yeah, so in, in general, you can uh, check our test containers org. Um, there's our documentation. And we also have the link to, um, yeah, to, to GitHub here. So if you want to use it, just go to GitHub, go to testcontainers.org and um, Yep, I think we have some good uh, documentation to get started and to use it. And especially if you want to use it for database testing, which is one of the most prominent ways of integration testing. Uh, it's really easy to get started. Uh, I've shown you one example. Another way to integrate it is a special JDBC support we have. Uh, and then you just use 
a magic uh, JDBC URL like this. And uh, it's a little bit like the H2 uh, JDBC URLs work where they will then spin up the H2 database for you in memory automatically. And this is the same way. So we have this TC prefix here and then you will, like that's all you have to do to specify this JDBC URL and then it will transparently underneath uh, spin up the uh, database for you in a container. And um, yes, this is what I also mentioned. This is the uh, Oracle module that we brought up um, yeah, to uh, more up-to-date recently. Uh, also, thanks to a uh, um, new, new Docker Oracle image we can now use that is on Docker Hub that is uh, provided by um, folks from the Oracle development community, actually. And um, yes. Uh, so I encourage you to check it out. And as you see, we even have like for bigger, more legacy like databases like DB2 is also possible to use it. And yeah, as I said, anything that works in a container will also work in test containers. And uh, yep, I, I hope you give it a try. And uh, if you have any questions further down the road, we have a Slack where you can get in touch with the community. You can go on to GitHub discussions or create GitHub issues if anything is up. And uh, yeah, then then that's that's it from my side if there are no further questions.